All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the National Constitution Center. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, I am Tom Donnelly. I am the Senior Fellow for Constitutional Studies here at the National Constitution Center, and so delighted to see everyone here. This is actually my first time in here for an event, so I'm very, very excited to share it, uh, this special moment with all of you. Tonight, we will obviously be talking about how to define truth um, in, the, in, in modern politics, which is a, an important and, and very difficult question. Uh, but before turning to our sensational panelists, I'd like to plug some of our upcoming programming here. Um, and in particular, we have some absolutely spectacular events coming up in May. I'm gonna plug two that are happening next week, actually. Uh, one is on Monday at noon. We're going to have uh, one of America's leading lawyers of the First Amendment, Floyd Abrams here, a great friend of the National Constitution Center, um, talking about his new book, The Soul of the First Amendment. And so it, I think it's a really great complement to the discussion we're gonna have today um, with some of the leaders in American media. Um, and then next week um, on May 10th, which is Wednesday um, at 6.30, we are going to have a, a newly announced event um, entitled uh, 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 digital privacy in the 21st century, which we're going, to be bring, we're going to bring together some of the leading scholars of the Fourth Amendment of national security um, to discuss the challenges of how do we translate the Fourth Amendment for the digital age and how do we balance the competing interests of security and privacy here in the 21st century. It's going to be a way in which we're kicking off um, a white paper series that we've put together here at the National Constitution Center with the generous support of Microsoft. And so we're gonna be bringing a lot of our white paper contributors here to discuss that important topic. And the anchor of the event will be our own great Jeffrey Rosen, our president and CEO, um, doing a, uh, giving a keynote on, you, you, this may be very surprising to you, what would Brandeis do in the digital age? And so combining two of his favorite topics, digital privacy and Louis Brandeis. So it should be a sensational event next Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. Sign up for it, come. I'll be moderating the panel so you'll get to see me too. I don't know if that's uh, uh, a deterrent or not, but uh, I wanted to, wanted to at least mention that as well. Um, but you know, tonight, uh, we're going to be talking about, again, defining truth in American politics today. And for us here at the National Constitution Center, our way into this discussion is our own new Madisonian initiative, a Madisonian Constitution for All, where we're going to have a sustained conversation over the next few years about what Madison and the framers would have thought of today's presidency, Congress, courts, and media. We began this discussion with great panels on Freedom Day last month. Uh, anchored by uh, Jeffrey Rosen um, about each of those um, institutions. And I'm delighted today to pick up the conversation today with three of the leading figures in American media. Um, so I'm gonna give just brief introductions for each and then we're gonna kick off that discussion. Um, so first panelist is Susan Glasser who is Politico's chief international affairs columnist and host of its uh, weekly podcast, The Global Politico. She served as the founding editor of Politico magazine and was editor of Politico throughout the 2016 election cycle, so she brings a very interesting perspective to this discussion. We also have Glenn Kessler, who writes the fact checker column for the Washington Post, one of my favorite things to read. Um, and during a, his journalism career stretched more than three decades, and he's covered almost every aspect of Washington policymaking, including policymaking in the White House and Congress. Um, and then finally, we have Brian Stelter, who's the host of CNN's Reliable Sources, which examines each week's top media stories. He's also senior media correspondent for CNN Worldwide and reports and writes for CNN and CNN Money. Please give a warm National Constitution Center welcome to Susan Glasser, Glenn Kessler, and Brian Stelter. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so as, as I said, one exciting initiative here at the National Constitution Center is we're, we're trying to think through how we could revive Mad Madisonian values <laughs> of reason discourse and reason compromise here in the 21st century. And you know, for, for, for Madison, his vision of the media was that it would serve as an important way of providing facts and reason for discourse in America with the idea that we're creating this new federal government, we're gonna attract the best and the brightest people to be elected, and they're going to lead a public discussion for all of us to refine public opinion and have it, uh, American policy really driven by compromise 
and discourse mediated by the media. Brian, just kicking it off to you, to what degree do you think that we're living up to this Madisonian ideal today or, 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 <laughs> or, or, or falling short? I hate to start in a pessimistic way, <laughs> but I think uh, many of us, not maybe most and hopefully not all, but many of us are living in what we used to call filter bubbles is the term five or six years ago uh, coined to describe the experience on Facebook of only uh, seeing and interacting with news and information that you already agree with. Uh, filter bubbles to me is now an outdated term and the filter prison may be the, the more appropriate term that folks are stuck, locked inside of their own choosing uh, these environments uh, that, that reinforce what they already believe. I was listening on the way down uh, to Philly today to Sean Hannity's radio show. Uh, Hannity and I have sparred a little bit, I'll have to be honest about that. Uh, he's called me a pipsqueak a, a bunch. <laughs> but but uh, it was important to be reminded that what his audience is hearing, the daily hatred of the media, it is hatred of, of the mainstream media. Uh, it's a poisonous thing, the same thing the president is, is delivering, a, a sort of verbal poison uh, to inoculate himself. I think it's important to recognize that many, not most, hopefully not most, they're certainly not all, but many people are in these prisons of their own making. Uh, and, and I find myself trying to push against the walls, making sure I'm seeing alternative views on Facebook, making sure I'm seeing opposing views on Twitter. Uh, but it's a challenge for all of us to make sure we're not locked inside those cells. And it's an interesting observation, and I think it certainly is the case that, that plenty of politicians and commentators make a living in bashing the American media. And uh, Susan, you've written an essay about, uh, about covering politics in, in Post-Truth America, which was really terrific, and you actually had some very nice things to say about political reporting today. I'm just going to read, the truth is that coverage of American politics and the capital that revolves around it is in many ways much better than ever before, faster, sharper, and far more sophisticated. Can you give us a sense of sort of what, the, what was the media environment say two decades ago, and how is it? How are the ways in which it's actually improved today? Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, bringing me back to my optimistic glass half full self, ah. uh, because <laughs> I have to tell you that 2016 challenged a lot of that optimism, uh, and I know we'll get to the to the next part of that essay. Uh, but I think you're right to spotlight the structural changes in the American media that have led us to this quandary that we're in now, and, and really we're all in it, because regardless yeah. of what your filter bubble or your filter prison is, we're actually all trapped by the same problem, and it is a dystopian version of what James Madison uh, envisioned. We don't have the best and the brightest, and we don't have the press playing the intermediation uh, and sort of neutral arbiter role that he might have envisioned, and, and that's, that's the truth regardless of mm. whether you live in your blue filter bubble or your red filter bubble. And what I wrote about in that essay was how in the time of my career, uh, which is now long, uh, in Washington, that really there have been enormous structural changes in the media. And of course, we're all familiar with the technology-enabled uh, disruption in the last few years and the rise of social media. But go back in time, for those of you who still remember it, think about the media environment of 1980 or 1984 and there were three TV networks, and there were a couple of national newspapers, and there was Time Magazine, and there was Newsweek. And in that media environment, uh, it was a completely different kind of thing, not only because it meant that the news cycle was slower and all those things, but just to the point about our politics and facts and truth. What we had for a rare, exceptional moment, I think, <laughs> in American media, as it turns out, was a, a public comment at which uh, we did have arbiters of the facts. Mm. And the idea was that whatever your opinion was, and you could read the Wall Street Journal opinion page if you were a conservative, and you could read the New York Times opinion page if you were a liberal, but the bottom line was we had an agreed upon set of facts, and our politics was a war over the narrative and what to make of it. And you know, then we had TV, we had Ronald Reagan, the master communicator, speaking to us from the TV. And remember, the great debate back then was about how much control the president and the politicians could exert over the narrative. Now, we live in this world that's out of control, uh, that is literally fragmented, atomized bursts of information in which it turns out we have another president uh, who is controlling 
in a way, but he, he can't control. He's, he's embraced the chaos and the anarchy mm. of the media moment. And I think it is a sort of a chaos and anarchy that this fragmentation has brought us. And correct me if I'm wrong, there was respect in the 1980s on the left and the right, right? The New York Times op-ed <laughs> page and the Wall Street op-ed, mostly respected each other. There was civility. That well, I don't see you know, right I, I'm not so old that I can say I was a practicing journalist at this time, but I was certainly <laughs> consuming <laughs> some of this. Well, and also there was the, the most important thing is there was a, a, you know, everyone sat down and watched Walter Cronkite and got the same basic information, and you know, and you, there was just very few, um, you know, I mean, right now, what the great advantage you have right now as a news consumer is you don't have to rely just on the filter of the New York Times or the Washington Post or CNN or something like that, you can go actually to the transcripts of a news conference. If you want to see the whole presidential news conference, uh, you know, when, when I was covering the White House during the Bill Clinton presidency, in order for me to get the pool report, which is now emailed and everyone can find it anywhere, in order for me to get the pool report of what the president did that day, I would have to walk to the White House, show my badge, <laughs> rummage through a bin of mimeographed <laughs> pieces of paper <laughs> in order to see what the transcript was of the president's remarks at the at the Jeez. you know at the um, you know the fundraiser the night before so now all of that is very democratic but it, uh, one thing that I, concerns me is that americans are not actually taking advantage of this freedom to challenge themselves they're living in these little blue or red bubbles and, you know, but what you really should be doing is reading people that you disagree with, finding out information on your own that challenges your pre preconceived notions. And um, unfortunately, people don't really do well, that. Well, people don't, because it's about psychology, right? People don't want to have their preconceived notions challenged. They have narratives. They have a way of mm -hmm. looking at the world. Those stories that we tell ourselves or that we're told about politics turn out to be possible. I was wrong, I have to admit. And that's part of why I wrote that, that essay for Brookings. I have always believed in this, this sort of almost this inexorable you know, sort of notion of progress that not only is sunlight the best form of disinfectant and accountability, but that we were living in a golden age of information. And for anyone who cared about information, for mm -hmm. anyone who cared about the truth, that the mere fact of it was enough. But I, I would say that the model failed to account for psychology. For, yeah, for human yeah. behavior. You were writing at Brookings that the quality of the news has never been better, right? That yeah, we, I we're, believe we're living that. in the best of times, yes. but the, the worst, worst of, of times. times. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was hoping not you, to finish the sentence that way, but. You, you should be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Brian, one, one thing you noted, Brian, was um, you, know, you, 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 uh, you analogized uh, tweets by politicians now almost to press releases of sorts. Mm -hmm. and, and, and can you talk a little bit about the challenges that this direct for, form of communication from politician to supporter uh, presents for journalists, but more generally for uh, public discourse, for shared discourse? Yeah, for one thing, uh, I think the, the president right now thinks in 140 characters. And uh, in some ways, we're all learning to think in, in that kind of amount of space that Twitter allots. Uh, certainly, I, I, you know, makes me a better writer in some ways to have to keep it short and, and to the point. Uh, but there are limits to the president's uh, ability, you know, comments, and, and when he's when he's short in that way, you know, I, when I look at his comments about the press, his anti-media attacks, you know, clearly uh, it has a corrosive effect. It's also, however, a chance to engage in media literacy. Every, every time he lies about the media, calls real news outlets fake news. It's a chance to explain how we're real and why we know we're real and how we prove our realness all the time. It's a way for us to reinforce our core values and our mission. Uh, however, that's not going to break through uh, to some of his most loyal supporters. And that's where we get into this sense of alternative realities, that we are living in this age of alternative realities. What Kellyanne Conway and Trump aides do so well is present counter narratives every single time, whether it's about wiretapping or about whatever was in the news today. Something that may not be true, but has enough truthiness to it, feels good enough uh, that people can opt in for that alternative reality. Uh, it seems to me Twitter and other, to some extent, other social media tools have made it easier to have those alternative realities and to have those counter narratives exist. One thing I'd like to say is that it's not just as simple as choosing something that's outright untrue. 
You know, that happens, yeah. that happens. But I think what I've noticed, both as an editor and as a writer, is the perniciousness of picking your truths. Not that you're picking between a truth and a lie, but that you're picking your truths. And so it, you only share things that support your yes. ideas. You only uh, encounter news with a particular spin on it. You only put that spin on it yourself. So it's mm. not that you're denying the facts that support someone else's political truth in this day and age. It's just that you're not going to engage with that content. You know, yeah. you're going to reinforce your own narrative. I'll but give a non-political I mean. example of that real quick. I've been covering Fox News all month. Bill O'Reilly, his resignation. What I get feedback from conservative Fox fans, they're not saying Bill O'Reilly is a stand-up guy, a great guy, a loyal patriot. Right. They're just saying, I don't care. Why are you obsessed with this? I don't care. I don't want to read about it. They're just picking and choosing what not to listen and pay attention to. Well, one of the things that uh, was very effective for, by President Trump during the campaign, you know, I fact-checked many of his statements. A every uh, one of his uh, statements. Uh, don't, uh, don't be uh, humble. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and there was huge numbers were completely false. But what he was very skillful at was making claims that his supporters already believed. So, hmm. uh, uh, and that way it resonated with those supporters. So he would say, the, uh, our borders are being overrun by illegal immigrants. Now the data all shows that illegal immigration has been going down. It, it wasn't, it ha isn't, the borders are not being overrun. But because he would say that, and that's something that his supporters believed, it was resonating that way. So when I would write a fact check and saying this is not correct, I would hear from the supporters and you know that no, I was wrong. Of course I was wrong. And of course Donald Trump was right. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> and so he, it was very, uh, you know, and he's a, he's a pretty good, uh, uh, he's very skillful at getting his message out. But that was something that struck me after fact checking him over and over again, that he was very strategic about making sure that the claims he made were things that his people believed. Hassan Minaj said it so well at the White House Correspondence Center on Saturday. He said, we're living in an age where trust is more important than truth. And you're saying that the, his fans trusted those statements, uh, believed them, whether they were true or not. Right, well, because you know, social science research shows that you were more receptive to things that confirm your preconceived That's biases. Right. Mm -hmm. So if he says, this is, these facts and, it res and, it, and for his, his supporters, these facts are things that they already believe, well then it's gonna, it's gonna stick with them. And it, it's hard for someone like me, who tries to separate out what is truth and what is, what is fiction, to make in inroads with, those, with people that believe, you know, are, are not gonna be receptive to my fact check because it disagrees right. with their preconceived notions. And, and, and Glenn, can you talk a little bit more about your you know, fact-checking process. I mean, people, you know, they, they famously, famously claim we live in a post-truth society. Your job is to separate out <laughs> fact from opinion. And, and sort of, what is your, I guess, what's your method for sort of finding at what you would take to be sort of an uncontestable fact versus an opinion or a fact that might be contested? Like, what, I, I don't know exactly how to answer, ask mm. the question, but oh, I'm curious about your process. Oh, okay. Well, we, we don't really fact-check opinion. I mean, the best fact-check is, is a statement with a number in it. Obviously, yeah. you, know, right. and, you know, numbers. Well, failing New York Times, that's hard to fact check, <laughs> isn't it? Because <laughs> what is the definition of failing? Right. Well, I mean, in the case of failing New York Times, you can say, actually, uh, since Donald Trump has been elected president, subscriptions have soared at the New York Times. Okay. <laughs> so, that well, one always <laughs> annoys me because I used to work at the Times, but <laughs> he doesn't have a number. He's not saying a, a number in that sentence. You no, know, but he will say, well, one of my favorite fact checks uh, from the campaign was uh, Donald Trump announced repeatedly in, in rallies that he was going to uh, uh, bargain for prescription drugs in Medicare and save $300 billion a year. Okay, that's a number, mm -hmm. and he says he's gonna save $300 billion a year for Medicare in, in prescription drugs. Medicare only spends $78 billion <laughs> a year on prescription yeah. drugs. So those mm -hmm. numbers don't quite add up, and in fact, uh, you know, in one of the debates, uh, Chris Wallace of Fox News actually took the numbers up that I had f identified and showed them to Trump. He says, 300, you know, doesn't add up. Trump didn't really respond, but, you know, that, that's, but that, you know, our process is, you have a number. We also look for um, uh, issues that are important, that are in the news. Uh, we get about 50% of the fact checks we do are from reader 
questions. Readers heard something and they want to know what the answer is. But the, the important part of the fact check, what, what I hope is that if you are a regular reader of the fact checker, you will get a gain in understanding about the complex issues involved in policy making in Washington. The, 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 you know, go checking the statement is just a means to an end. That's why you put the grade at the end, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to eat your peas before yeah, you, you get want to us the to read. <laughs> but look, it's still an yes, art, not works. a science. It works. And that yeah. is the, the, the thing that any fact checker will admit to. It's still an art, not a science. And I think that's where people get tripped up mm. and, you know, Give me your methodology. Give me your typology. Well, we're, 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 we're reporters. And, and, the, and the Pinocchios are just... By the way, Pinocchios are... are you know, know, which, by yeah. the way, Glenn and I have an, a long history in mm. this. I actually was the editor who came up with the fact checker and, and yeah. the oh, Pinocchios. I didn't know and that. I'm oh, so yeah. delighted <laughs> that they're, they're still in existence mm. all these <laughs> That's cool. years later. Are there more four Pinocchio ratings now? Are people lying more than they used to that would when be the column started? Uh, well, we do, yeah. It, it, we have <laughs> lots and lots of four Pinocchio. We have Donald Trump earned 59 during the <laughs> campaign. He's earned an additional 16 since he became president. And, uh, you know, it, it's a bit... It's a, it's a bit overwhelming. Uh, Trump kind of, <laughs> he, he kind of, he kind of skews the scale. I think other politicians in general, if you, if you were to take him out of it, uh, you know, Republicans and Democrats, I mean, it, it, the, the, there's no difference between the parties in that both of them will stress the truth if they think it will give them a political edge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a key American tradition, I think. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, so one thing that I get from all of your comments so far is, though, a problem that spans the ideological spectrum and partisanship, and that's that whether we're a progressive, a centrist, a conservative, a libertarian, whatever, we all are plagued by our own human fallibility and confirmation biases. We have, and we now have a media ecosystem that can Please feed it. it more yep. efficiently. And yep. you know, as we're thinking through ways of harnessing new technologies to you know, attack our own fallibility, our own human weaknesses, what can American media do to basically help us get out of the way of ourselves and be able to see the best arguments on, on, on both sides of the given issue? What, what, what are some constructive things that we can expect from media? Hmm. You know, we're so rarely asked to be constructive, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Everybody's why is a the critic. Why is the burden on the media? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, what about the American people? The fault people? is in <laughs> ourselves, right, that we are men. I mean, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's really, I do think it's, it's, it's the persistence of human agency and psychology. Remember, fake news has been around since people have been around, mm -hmm. right? And we have incredible distribution tools for it now. And uh, it's, it's like anything, we've made it so easy in this day and age. But I think, you know, what I come back to is there are reasons to be optimistic in the midst of this moment of really creative and not so creative destruction, right? Mm. Uh, you know, we were talking about this a little bit in the green room. I do think, you know, the outpouring of activism, the fact that the New York Times has literally millions more paying subscribers than it did one year ago, millions more, uh, is something that means that there are more resources being devoted to journalism. I just um, signed up for the Washington Post, finally, I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I you waited were free as long riding as I could. All this time? I tried for years to avoid it, but I finally <laughs> gave it and paid. And, I, and I'm not the only one. People are paying yeah. for news in a way they mm. haven't before. No, that's right. I mean, I think. You're, you're welcome, Glenn. Yep. You're I talking about <laughs> the disruption of the economy in a way that, you know, it affects our democracy in a particular way, but nothing that we're seeing here would actually be unfamiliar to people looking at a case study in any other business. Right. We went from a scarcity economy. News was scarce in this day and age that I was talking about initially, yeah. right? With the three TV networks and a handful of national papers and a uh, couple of national news magazines. It was a scarcity economy. Those who had access to the information dictated the terms upon which you receive that information. Now, we're in the exact opposite. It's not that different from the Walmart economy as opposed to, you know, the economics of 19th century America, right? You know, we are just, we've transformed news from something that was held by a small number of people and could therefore be parceled out responsibly, hmm. right, to something that is everywhere and all around us and we all are individually empowered uh, to deal with it. I would say, as a parent, 
Let's talk about education if you want right. to talk about how exactly. we're going to be better. It's not well, yeah. the news yeah. media's fault per se. What are what are consumers doing with it? If we're all our own entrepreneurs but, now and we're all our own news uh, consumers and editors and that's producers. That's a big job. We well, all have to be so our own editors. So it's a cultural transformation of sorts. Well, there, yeah. There, there, yeah. There, yeah, there are actually now high schools and college courses and in learning have become good news consumers yeah. and how to identify poorly done journalism, fake news, other aspects of journalism. But there is, there, there, I mean, yeah. it's, it's a trend at uh, college but, campuses. But I don't want to yeah. let media companies off the hook either. Yeah. I don't well, want to let newsrooms yeah. off the hook For either. Sure. <laughs> For sure. I, it, it, but, you know, I, I would make the case mm -hmm. that, that media companies, the CEOs, should be spending some more money on media literacy, on these educational Absolutely. initiatives right, that we're describing. Right. Uh, I would put even more onus on Facebook and on Apple and on Google. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, these companies gave us some of the coolest tools on the planet. They allowed us all to have smartphones, uh, so we have access to everything in the world and everyone in the world. And they gave us the internet and the World Wide Web and Facebook. Uh, they handed this, these incredibly powerful and scary and damaging and enlightening and wonderful tools and didn't really teach us how to use them. I mean, if, if, we, step, if we step way back, do any of us really feel like we know how to use these tools, these incredible technologies. I don't, and it's my job. Well, and by the way, I, I they share didn't... fake stories by accident like everybody else does. Well, and it's not only, it's even more pernicious than that, right? Like, arguably, their business model, they were set up to maximize profit taking. They didn't invest in that. The reason that they didn't teach you to right. do it is because they didn't make it a priority. And economically, they chose to make money off of content while pretending that they weren't content companies. Yes. And I yeah. think that that is obviously now. You know, Silicon Valley is shocked into yeah, now recognizing up, that their role that they play in our society, in our democracy, is different than what, by the way, people were telling them for a long time. So yeah. I absolutely think it, Brian's yeah. point is really important when it comes to the platform companies, which is the mm -hmm. lingo people are mm -hmm. using. I also <laughs> think, you know, when it comes to television, cable television, when well, it comes I was about to, to get to that part, you know, TV. Let's, <laughs> let's let's be real here. You know, we've we've turned. Uh, a public good into entertainment, uh, at which there is a certain you know profit assigned to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as having a controversial, bombastic, outrageous reality show president is, it's good business for the television networks of America, and they don't care whether he lies. In fact, that's part of what makes it a good TV show. Well, I work at one, mm -hmm. and I care if he lies. I know you care, but I would say that the economics of it don't mm. suggest, first of all, they suggest that it's okay if he lies because that makes it more interesting. So they're happy for people like you to criticize him because that's part of the show, right? It, well, then, then, then it gets really, then it gets kind of a sad commentary that we're, yes, we employ fact checkers, but it's all in the service of a, of a show for the president. I mean, I, I do think, you know, think about television, one of my pet peeves to pick on a kind of a small example of a big problem the labeling of guests and the labeling of stories and the labeling of certain shows, you know, again, not to pick on my friend Sean Hannity, his show and Fox newscast are labeled the same. They look like they're the same thing. They're not. They're different products. Uh, there's, you know, versions of that that are less uh, severe on CNN. Uh, it might say political commentator on the bottom of the screen when it really should say former Trump campaign aide mm -hmm. and then seven other disclosures about what that aide does. Uh, we expect the audience sometimes to know all of this stuff to know the differences in the product. And that's unrealistic. I, I fantasize about, this is, I have weird fantasies, okay? Mm -hmm. Five years mm -hmm. from now, I fantasize about a version of my glasses that are uh, augmented with augmented reality, uh, that if I look at a, a conservative news site, that I'm reminded of its origins. If I look at a liberal site, I'm reminded of its, of its funder, of its funding sources. Uh, we almost need a layer on top of the news to tell us what kind of news we're consuming. Uh, not so different from a nutrition label on the back of my McDonald's bag. We've come a long way labeling fast food. We're not labeling news or these news-like substances that are not actually high quality. Is that dorky? I know that's really dorky, but I'm just trying to brainstorm what we could do. Well, speaking of labeling, I mean, and just and not to defend of content uh, providers or not, what, what do we call them? The platform. Platform. <laughs> platform <shows. laughs> um, so uh, I, went, I approached Google two years ago about the idea of elevating fact checks mm. in the search results. Right. And it took a, a, a lot of work by a lot of people, but in the last month or so... It's happening, isn't it's, it? It's happening, and it you, if you were searching for something about some particular information, it will come up and it will say, you know, this was fact-checked by the Washington Post, it got two Pinocchios, 
or it was fact-checked by PolitiFact, and th this, over time, it will be completely integrated with the search results. Facebook also has, uh, is working with fact-checking organizations from around the world to vet things that are identified by readers as potentially fake news, and the fact-checking organizations, if it's determined this is indeed fake, that thing, before you, t you try to share that fake news story, you're gonna get a pop-up that right. says, this is fake, are you sure you wanna share it? And then if you do share it, anyone who sees it, it's gonna have that label over it also. So it's just beginning baby steps, but I do think that, in th that they are being responsive to some of these concerns, and over time, people will be educated. They'll realize when they're just going through Google, oh look, here's a fact check about this claim made by the president. Well, and I think that's a really important point too about it's not just an accident, it's not just the fault of human psychology. Uh, you know, like real people made decisions at, at Facebook and at mm. Google. Uh, these algorithms didn't spring full blown from, you know, nowhere. They came from people making decisions about them, number one. Number two, there is been a concerted structural effort uh, to create news organizations that would exploit either for commercial purposes, you know, for page views and to make money off of it, or for uh, propagandistic purposes to create this news that was then distributed through these very powerful pipelines. And if you look at RT, the Russian uh, English language news service, or Sputnik, or the Chinese version of an English language news service, we did a very interesting story that turned out to be very ahead of the curve uh, at Foreign Policy Magazine a few years ago, uh, before all of this really came into public attention. And what it found was there were so many stories around the world, if you Googled them, because BBC had been cut back, because America was no longer in the business of doing this, because there had been cutbacks at so many American independent news organizations, often the only English language content that you could find would be just mm. on some like you know uh, uh, <laughs> earthquake in Nepal yeah, or something plane like that. Crashing, yeah. You know, absolutely, yeah. it would be from RT, uh, and that you know it was a structural shift mm. that uh, you know state actors were moving in on. So I don't want people to think we're all just saying we're blaming you and it's mm. all your fault and you got to <laughs> stop eating junk food of news. You know, because I don't think I do think there were yeah. really structural things that happened here. Yeah. And then, Glenn, I saw that you had, had written a post that was a fact checker's guide to identifying fake news. If, mm -hmm. if we treat tonight as a bit of a, um, you know, a public service announcement of sorts, what, what are some of the ways in which, just as a consumer of news, uh, you know, we might be able to separate out something that might be fake can, news? Can we define else? fake news first? Are we using the president's definition? <laughs> or are we using Glenn's definition? Uh, Glenn, <laughs> why don't you can give we us use your Glenn? definition? Yeah. I don't want to use the president's. CNN is fake news, he says. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, fake news is, is invented news. Uh, you know, it, it, for instance, a very widely shared story during the election, a million shares on Facebook, was that Pope Francis had endorsed Donald Trump. And um, the fact check of that, done by Snopes, which uh, mm. often debunks things in the internet, got uh, 22,000 shares. So it's, you know, it's, it's hard to sometimes <laughs> catch the lie before it runs around the globe. Um, in, the, in the guide to fake news, a lot of it has to be, you have to be a discerning consumer. So, you know, and part of the problem with, with particularly things in your Facebook feed is you may just see that headline, and a headline from, you know, the, the Beacon News, I think that was one or one organization, the Boston Beacon. Or the called. Denver Guardian. Or something Sounds like, real. Right. Sounds it, legit. And that headline is going to look the same as a New York Times or Washington Post headline. Yeah. So you actually have to go look at the... So in, the, in that post I wrote, you know, I looked at one particular fake news story, and there were all sorts of clues there. For instance... Um, mm. the, the URL, it was, it, I, this one particularly, I guess it was, it called itself ABC News. <laughs> so it, it sounds a lot like ABC News, but the, but the, a, you know, the URL for ABC News 
is something like abcnews.com. And yeah. this was no, not anything near that ah, kind of URL. Right. Right. And the logo wasn't quite a circle. It was more of an oval. <laughs> right, right. If you looked at it carefully. And then, you know, you look at the, look at the byline of the, of the writer. Now, in the news business, we look, at, we look at bylines all the time. I know in the general public, people may not notice who writes it. But often these, these things, these news sites will have, they'll have bylines and they'll have bios. If you click to the bio of this particular article, it was like a joke. <laughs> it talked about how mm. he, he, he married his Nepalese, a, a woman who was a, a oh, he married, not Nepalese, Syrian. He married a Syrian refugee and they had nine children together. <laughs> it, it, so that's a clue. And then you check well, the About Us page and it took you actually to um, a photo of a house which uh, was um, uh, um, uh, one of these fringe religious groups. I, I the Westboro Baptist Church. Yeah, yeah, it took you to the Westboro, right. It took you to the Westboro, a picture of the Westboro Baptist Church, and it had the address for the Westboro Baptist Church, but said that was the address of ABC News, somewhere in Topeka, Kansas. <laughs> so all those are signs that this was really not a particularly uh, right. solid piece of journalism. Oh, I guess the bio also mentioned that the author had won four Pulitzer Prizes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my concern is that fake news, uh, in that definition, which is, you know, stories designed to deceive you, just to mess with you and trick you and fool you, my concern is that that's going to get more and more sophisticated. That uh, it's only going to get worse. And I, I, mean, I hate to be pessimistic again, but <laughs> that it's only going to get harder out there to discern. I had a story um, uh, made up about me a couple months ago that was really sneaky. The first paragraph were all real things I'd actually said on CNN. And then the next three paragraphs were all made up quotes. They were all just like a little bit crazier, you know? And I didn't know if it was true until I had to go look at the transcript and make sure that I really had not said it. And if I can barely tell, then how's my mom supposed to be able to tell and how are you supposed to be able to tell? That is my concern is as we move into fake news videos, fake news audio, that this is gonna become a more and more serious problem. Now Facebook says it's trying to fix it. I was at their headquarters a couple weeks ago. They swear they're trying to do all the right things about this. They say Zuckerberg himself's really involved, and I think he is, but it's gonna get harder out there. And, and I, I think maybe it's important to recognize the spectrum of news, that like if, if made up stories that are totally bogus are over here, and the New York Times and CNN and Politico and Washington Post are hopefully over here, there's a lot of stuff in the middle also. Uh, and, and that's why I say I wish we had augmented reality to recognize it, but I'm glad increasingly a lot of folks, at least, are going toward the other end of the spectrum and paying for the New York Times and paying for the Washington Post because it's going to get harder and harder to recognize the bogus stuff, I think, on the other end. Well, uh, that's my way, fear, at least. Even the terminology suggests the problem that we face going forward. Remember, mm. this fake news thing, at first it was seen correctly as a critique of President-elect Trump uh, last fall and the idea that he was circulating fake news. Well, he did something that was sort of genius, but in an evil way, right? You know, he appropriated the terminology of fake news. And rather than, you know, s saying, okay, this is a critique of me and this is damaging and I'm gonna change the subject or something else that a more conventional politician would do. Yeah. He did something that from a sort of media manipulation standpoint was brilliant, but it suggests the, the problem we have, which is he has tried to appropriate the term fake news. So now, even to have as three journalists who care a lot about <laughs> the truth and a lot about facts, to have a conversation here on the stage with each other about fake news, you have to say, well, wait <laughs> a minute. What are we talking about? Okay, yeah. fake news, which fake news? If we were, you know, and this is, of course, I think it's a huge problem for us going forward. It's how the president sets an agenda. We're, yeah. we're wow. having to defend ourselves against his attacks. That's all about this weekend in Washington. Yeah. At the dinner, it was all about setting up and saying, we're not the enemies of the people. That's right, uh, which doesn't come across well, doesn't play well. No, people, we're on defense. Regular people mm -hmm. think, well, they must have something to hide. Yeah. No, we like, don't, I swear. <laughs> no, I mean, in, in, in terms of the solutions to reinvigorating public discourse, we've talked about the need for a cultural transformation and just really have news consumers who look more skeptically at information and attempt to uh, uh, be more open to uh, reading broadly arguments on all sides. We've talked about perhaps the social media platforms themselves taking some actions um, that can make that job easier rather than harder. Yeah. Are there other potential solutions you can think of either within uh, ways in which the American media writ large could change or um, you know, other, other ways to promote this sort of, uh, uh, you know, a move toward, a move away from 
whether it's a post-truth society, whatever you want to call it, our own, you know, our own individual truths to something that's more a public commons and reasoned debate. Is there more that we can be doing? Bring back Walter Concord. <laughs> right. yeah, Walter Cronkite. I was about to say, maybe the cell phone towers go down for a week and we all have to talk to each other in right. person. I don't know. Is that crazy? Hmm. Well, it's an interesting question. Did Americans really agree with each other more? Uh, there is evidence to suggest that this is a more uh, segregated society by partisan affiliation than in the past. And I always tell everybody, these, the transformation of the media and the transformation of politics do not occur in isolation from right, each other. Right. Okay, so in the 1976 election, a very close presidential election, 24 states were competitive, were on the battleground map, 24 wow. states. Uh, by the time of President Obama's re-election campaign against Mitt Romney, it was basically a battleground of 10 states, and that was being somewhat generous in terms mm. of the definition, right? So what increasingly, basically, it's the sorting of America into where you live uh, is also what party you're affiliated with. Uh, in that 2012 election, now things have been scrambled a bit by 2016, in that 2012 election, mm. basically, if you found out what city somebody lived in and how big the city was, not even mm. necessarily the location, what state, you knew the answer to which party they were far more likely to have voted for. So basically, a city under 100,000 huh. voted for Mitt Romney. Well, there was a fascinating- That's it, period. Wow. A fascinating uh, poll I saw, and I don't know, it indicates some progress in American society, but it also shows how we're getting more divided. Uh, Americans these days, are more likely to say they would be upset yes, if, their, if their child came home with, and said they wanted to marry someone of a different party than of a different race. Yeah. Yes. It was more acceptable that mm -hmm. they married someone from a different race than if they came home and it was a different party. Yeah. So that shows how partisan we're becoming. Wow, <laughs> no, that is, that, that's something else. So I mean, is, so, I mean one of the uh, uh, ways in which we try to go about fighting against this polarization and this balkanized discourse here at the Constitution Center is we have this great online tool and, and, and app called our Interactive Constitution where we bring together the best scholars, uh, liberal scholars and conservative scholars to debate each clause of the Constitution. And what we force them to do is come together, write a thousand words about what they agree about that particular clause. So it could be the Second Amendment or it could be Article One, Section 8 and Congressional Powers and then write a thousand words in terms of what they disagree about. And so it allows you know all citizens to just log on, go in, look and they could see the best arguments on all sides and we vetted it with the American Constitution Society, the leading liberal organi legal organization, and the Federalist Society, the leading conservative organization. And so this is a model where there's you know, good information for vigilant citizens if they're looking to learn more about their constitution. Um, I, my question though is, it, I, I, surely there are other products like this out there in different tranches, whether it's policy or whether um, uh, you know, or, or, or you know, in different policy areas. Uh, what can we do to sort of get more people to find this information? Is it, yes, I'm sorry. Well, no, I mean, this is great, and that's a fantastic project, by the way, that you have here at the National Constitution Center. I recommend mm. it to everybody. But this goes to the point about journalism, information writ large, whether it's journalism or from uh, academia or think tank, has never been better by many of these indices. And you mm. can go to different policy areas. And you know what? You're going to find more vigorous debate, discussion, reporting, access to firsthand, easy access to the leading experts in the field, whatever the field is, than ever before. You know, it's not just that poor Glenn had to go to the White House to get that pool report. <laughs> Basically, any subject in the world that you care about, especially connected with our, our national government, I think it might not be as true in, in certain state and local levels where there hasn't been the level of uh, investment or uh, economic reason to invest in it. You can find more information now and, and genuine information, have access to direct experts in your field, whatever it is, more easily than ever before in history. That's not the problem. And in many cases, by the way, uh, y there's a large audience for this stuff, you know, whatever it is, and they've made it easy for you to access. Mm, the problem is navigating it, number one, right? So having the time to differentiate, to tell what's a good source, what's not. Uh, number two, there's the economic basis upon which journalism or think tanks or academia uh, going forward, they're all being disrupted to a certain extent. And I mm -hmm. think the business models are broken for many of them. Uh, and so I think that's a genuine concern. Uh, and so 
realizing you have to pay for information uh, for it to really have value, uh, I think is something that, that is gonna have to be restored in some way for some of these projects to go forward. No, I mean, uh, it, to, to what degree is our, our, our so it, it strikes me that our, our polarized discourse, um, uh, to what degree is it a f sort of a natural function of really two different things? One being what you talked about, Susan, which is just of. this avalanche of information. Me, I, I love the news. I've been a news junkie my whole life, and I've never felt more bewildered by what's out there. Should mm -hmm. I be reading Vox, or should I be reading reports from Brookings, or AI, or whatever? Um, that combined with what, what, you've, what you've said, Brian, which is just this beyond 24-7 news media, I mean, is there any way that just all of us here as vigilant citizens, <laughs> is there any way to avoid just going with, you know, the partisan cues and heuristics? Because there's just, the world is so complicated and there's so much information. I mean, it, it's true that with some of what we're describing, uh, if there's any entrepreneurs in the audience, there's some startups that could be <laughs> born from what we're talking about. I'm a little bit surprised uh, this many months after November, we haven't seen more come out of the ashes of the election in terms of news startups, new kinds, of, new brands of news. Um, I guess if I had the idea, I would go do it myself. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sitting here with the answer, but I think there is a lot of room for innovation in the news business to try to address some of what we're describing. And I also wonder, uh, you know, I agree with Carl Bernstein who said on my program yesterday that we're almost in a state of civic civil war. Uh, I think it is that serious. But um, to some degree, the entertainment world, the, the, the cultural community, can maybe do some things to help. Uh, you know, you were, you were asking for solutions, and I was sitting here feeling like an idiot, <laughs> having, having no idea. But if you think about the ways that not the news business, but the entertainment business has changed society, has changed people's value structures and, and moral views, uh, there might be room within entertainment, which is famously a liberal-leaning community, to try to bridge some divides. I wonder if through humor and through entertainment and through common, uh, even though we have a thousand options of what to watch now, if we see each other, including Trump voters and non-Trump voters, reflected in our entertainment as well as our news, if maybe that helps a little bit. So I'm, I'm, I'm yearning for optimism here and thinking a little bit about what those TV shows might look like. Maybe that's another entrepreneurial option. Well, part of it also is just, you know, approaching people in a, in a, a at a, at a ground level experience. Yeah, an approachable way. Well, I mean, it's, I don't know if you've seen it. It may have been in your Facebook feed. There was a pretty nifty ad put together by Heineken uh, that, um, where they took people of different political beliefs but didn't tell them they were completely different political <laughs> beliefs. <laughs> and then they assemble a bar together and get to know each other. And then just before they, you know, have, they have the beers there ready to drink, on comes a video and, and a woman who's, who's transgender sees that the guy that she's making the bar with says he hates transgenders, the transgender people and doesn't think they're real. And they look at each other and then, they, and then the announcer says, now you can walk out or you can have the beer. And from that common base of having built the bar, they all decide right. to sit down and have the and, beer. And corporate America then can be part of the answer here. Right, exactly. right? It, well, Even though it's, it's beneficial for them to be making ads to sell their products, Maybe that can help. Well, but can I just say, I feel like that's a little bit of a liberal fantasy. And that's part of the problem <laughs> is that, you know, what you then have is sort of like, this is Blue America's program for figuring out how to talk to Red America, which doesn't, might not want to participate in that program. Huh. I, you know, I, I worry that that's some of it. Well, to my point about Hollywood also, well, right? If a bunch absolutely. of liberals try to write sitcoms appealing so to everybody. So then they're going <laughs> to preach to people their values of liberal tolerance or whatever. Right. But I, I do have a, a, an optimistic maybe germ of a notion, Excellent. which is that, you know, par a lot of the media that we're talking about, first of all, it's not one size fits all. And you guys, of course, know that all because you're consumers of it, but it bears repeating this conversation. Most of the sort of crisis of the public commons that we're talking about really are big general interest uh, legacy institutions in, in the case of yeah. uh, the Washington Post or the New York Times, even in the case, of, arguably, of CNN, yep. which is transition big general interest things that rely on big audience that's trying to serve a broad cross section of the American people. I feel that there's still a fair amount of optimism when it comes to other models of media and other kinds of media. So you asked me about, you, you raised the great point of what you're doing here at the National Constitution Center. When you look at sort of vertical media, you know, media that is uh, organized around, say, a subject where mm -hmm. everything that you need to know about healthcare, uh, if you're in the business of healthcare, or everything that you need to know about uh, 
you know, technology or, you know, pick your industry. You've seen an incredible amount of innovation uh, in the journalism and the information available in all those spaces and how the experts in those fields communicate yeah. with people. And uh, much of it is, is subscription journalism. It's paid. It's not relying on eyeballs or viewership as the only model of economic success. And I think those really offer a much more positive uh, state of the media when you look at that kind of media that is w for what people need to do their jobs, broadly speaking, you know, in their professional life in some way. Because then, you know, it's not about cheering for your home team, whether mm -hmm. it's the blue shirts or the red shirts, right? And I, it's, you know, I always felt like that was the real good news story, was that people might, you know, watch Fox or watch MSNBC, depending upon their political preferences, but that when it came to what they had to tell their boss, about whether they could invest in Turkey this year. You know, they really didn't want that coming through a partisan filter. Right. They would want something independent. Now, that's come into question a little bit, but I still feel much more positive about that state of the media than I do about the broader general interest American media yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. well, that's a great optimistic note. We have some great questions from our audience. We'll dig right in. We've obviously talked a lot about new media here, but here's a question about the old media. Uh, where do you think newspapers will be in five years, and what would their role be in this overall transformation? Well, let's just say thank you to Jeff Bezos, I guess, for uh, <laughs> <laughs> keeping one great American newspaper alive. I don't know. Yeah. People have been predicting the demise of newspapers for a long time. It hasn't happened yet, but the physical newspaper, uh, like everybody here, I've noticed them disappearing gradually from uh, the, the front porches of our neighbors, and we're right in the middle of, of Washington, D.C., and, uh, you know, there's fewer and fewer people who are getting it. Yeah, yeah I, 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 the editor of the Washington Post, Marty Barron, has said he's not sure if there would be a print version of the Washington Post in 10 years. It's, you know, and, and um, you know, for what I do, uh, I mean, the Washington Post produces... Remember, the iPhone only came out 10 years ago. So much yeah. has happened in 10 right, years right, right, so right. far. And, well, and for, so, for instance, uh, uh, the, the, the Washington Post fact checker, it appears in print one day a week, but it's online five days a week. It, the, the Washington Post produces more content than it has ever produced before. Like we have about five, 450, 500 articles a day. Only a fraction of that ends up in the print edition. And in terms of, you know, I get, I get tra we daily traffic reports and I see that, that uh, on a, any given day, uh, more than 50% of my readers are reading my articles on mobile, on their phones. And only like 20% now read it you know, on, a, on a computer. Or and that has like. happened so fast. Exactly. That so moved from desktop to mobile. Right. Just so that in terms of the, the print edition, I mean, if you were to reinvent a newspaper today, you wouldn't say to someone, hey, let's grind up a bunch of trees, run a, <laughs> you know, put, and then put all those pieces of paper on big giant trucks yeah. and deliver it hand by hand to a, to a house. I it think it'll be a, I think, uh, I think for the Philly Inquirer and for the New York Times and the Post, it'll be a class product, not a mass product. Uh, six years ago tonight, uh, bin Laden's death was announced uh, by President, then President Obama. What did you do the next day? I bought the newspaper. I wanted the print copy. Uh, on those occasions, I think there will still be print copies. And certainly for people that want to pay for a big fat paper on Sundays, there will be. But it'll be a class product costing more and more and more. Uh, and the mass product will be the web. Uh, how do ratings influence the coverage of news? And do you believe uh, the amount of coverage has any influence over our filter pr uh, prisons? Is that one for me? That is for you, Brian. <laughs> Why don't you take uh, that? So I had pretty good ratings yesterday, uh, so I can, I can feel good answering this. Uh, here, here's my honest assessment as someone who does look at the numbers every day. Uh, we get television ratings uh, that'll tell us, you know, for every 15 minutes how people are watching. On the web, of course, we're getting minute-by-minute minute traffic uh, about what people are reading and what they're watching online. But on television, uh, ratings are a factor, not the only factor, at least in my experience at CNN. Uh, if you don't have ratings, then you don't have anything. Uh, you don't have an audience, you don't have anybody listening to your words, uh, and you can't get great guests. If you do have ratings, you can do a lot. And what I mean by that is you can challenge your viewers, you can book unexpected people, you can surprise your audience by doing things in new ways. Ratings don't force you into one lane, necessarily, but ratings are a factor. You need to have an audience and be appealing to an audience uh, in order to be able to then take them to new places and surprise them with new guests 
That's the way I think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can get you in the door, well, then I can show you something special. But I've got to get you in the door uh, and, and, and have an audience. Uh, now, I think some networks and some specific shows are more obsessed with ratings than, say, I am. Bill O'Reilly, who lost his job recently, famously looked at the minute-by-minute -minute numbers, which I've never seen from <laughs> my show. Literally, you can see mm -hmm. up and down, up and down, and if mm -hmm. he didn't like that guest, if that guest dropped, that guest was canned. And that was <laughs> very, very specific. He was obsessed with that. There are other shows, I suspect, that are like that, too, in news. But it's not like that across the board. Uh, ratings are a factor. I would say they're not the only factor. And the same on the web. Uh, we may write more stories uh, about the president's uh, misstatements because we know people care about his misstatements. And that's a good thing. I think uh, mostly a good thing. What role do you see in uh, universities' preparation of journalists in solving this problem? I see a reduction of journalism programs and less reliance on expensive university wor uh, uh, investigative work. How mm. does this affect how the media does its job today? Well, uh, you know, you don't have to go to a university to become a journalist, frankly. Uh, well, and not yeah. only that, but I would say you certainly don't have to go to a journalism school, although many of them mm -hmm. are very excellent. Mm -hmm. You know, the bottom line is that uh, actually this is something I'm pretty optimistic about. In my view, just like our journalism has improved and become faster, smarter, and more adaptive and more knowledgeable more quickly, the same is true of the quality, the incredibly high quality mm -hmm. of young people uh, coming to organizations like Politico and CNN, I'm sure, uh, compared with uh, in the past. And these are smart, savvy kids. Many of them have a lot of experience that we were much more sheltered, had much less access to information and real life experience than uh, uh, young American students coming from uh, many different kinds of universities today. So I feel very positive about the kind of people who are coming into journalism today. Mm. I think I'm not a believer that you have to go to journalism school uh, or any particular kind of school no, to be a journalist at you all. Just, yeah, you just have to be curious and, and skeptical. And well, and that's the part that is harder and harder, truthfully, because that's where the thought, the, the bubble I think could affect the next generation of future journalists. And mm. if they're growing up in this incredible information environment and partisan environment, how is that going to affect our future journalists 10 years from now and, and 15 years from now? That's something I hadn't thought of before. But that yeah, could right. And that's we're right. starting to hear anecdotally about more students wanting to sign up for journalism classes in schools as a result uh, of the last few months. I, I mean, at least I'm hearing that anecdotally. Uh, some of my colleagues have, I hope that we'll see it start to show up in the data in the next couple of years, uh, a new generation of journalists that are motivated, both by the weaknesses and the flaws of you know, the folks that are doing it today, uh, and also um, excited by the challenge the journalists I, face I, with press freedom. I credit the movie Spotlight. Spotlight, <laughs> yes, right? By the way, the, the movie All the President's Men is my husband's mm -hmm. favorite movie. It's one of my mm -hmm. favorite movies, too. He's the chief White House correspondent for the New York Times. And you know that is the reason that he wanted to be a journalist. Is is Woodward and Bernstein inspired an entire generation of journalists? And it may well be mm. that whatever comes out of this crazy topsy turvy era mm. in our politics will will produce a new generation. Yeah, and just one mm. thought: there's there's chances for students to be learning the tools that that I'm already starting to get uh, uh, you know having a hard time using. I mean, I'm I'm allegedly a millennial. And yet I have no idea how to use Instagram stories. And I know there's probably great ways <laughs> to create really interesting journalism on Instagram stories or on Snapchat, but, but I'm, I'm giving up on myself right now. So there's chances for students to help us uh, use these tools we've been given in ways that, you know, that I can't. We have Snapchat fact checks. Snapchat fact checks? Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. yeah look like this up. <laughs> Well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> thank you so much for this terrific discussion. Uh, let's give a great <laughs> National Constitution Center applause for Susan, Glenn, and Brian. Mm -hmm. Thanks for uh, a great thank night. You. And thank you, everyone. <laughs>